Russia, a place where seemingly everything is flipped on its head. You don't read books, books read you. Polar bears don't kill you, they're the average pet, and this holds no difference for movies. Have a plot for a movie with an alien in yellow turning everything to dust? We'll steal it seven years before you do it. Wait, what? Yeah, you guys know Infinity War? Well, they stole from this movie, The Darkest Hour. Directed by the same guy who did Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, which actually is MCU actors weirdly enough. Well, being serious, they didn't really steal anything from this movie. It's more of a joke that they both involve aliens with similar goals and are apocalyptic type movies, except this is in Russia. But since absolutely nobody seems to know about this hidden relic from the early 2010s, and the last time I looked at one of this dude's films, it was the craziest thing ever, I thought I'd take a look back at this bizarre film that finally does the one thing end-of-the-world movies can't do, and that is be set in somewhere other than Los Angeles. The film begins with a sort of mapping of the universe, throughout the planets and stars with energy I guess, which always makes me wish there was a prologue that showed us how these aliens came across Earth, or how they conquered other planets. I know that defeats the mystery and it might have been explained in a sequel, but since none happened, it kind of leaves me wanting more, like way more, and not necessarily in a good way. Because we can assume the dotted lines are the aliens making their way across the planets, but like how? Why did they choose those specific planets? Why? Was their planet on the brink of collapse, or are they just violent curmudgeons? However, the music is very cool and eerie, and it sets the mood for a surprisingly serious movie. I say that because when I found this movie in the middle of 2021 on Netflix, its description made me think this was a fish-out-of-water comedy about Americans stuck in Russia, which would already be kind of funny to see, and then the added cheesiness of these aliens wrecking havoc but I can't seem to find the exact description that focused on them being outsiders. Maybe it's a mix of faulty memory and the removal of it from Netflix in the US. Oh, and the composer for this movie is the same guy who did the FNAF movie, the John Wick movies, Guardians of the Galaxy, both Volume 1 and 2, The Buckle Experiment, Pearl, Atomic Blonde, and more. Eventually, we meet our main character, Sean, played by Emile Hirsch, who's been in a lot of movies like Into the Wild or Prince Avalanche with Paul Rudd, and Ben is played by Max Minghella, who's in Spiral from The Book of Saw, The Social Network, and The Handmaid's Tale. They're in a plane with Sean playing Dead Space Mobile, which seems like the worst way to play it, when the flight attendants tries to get Sean to turn off the phone because it interferes with the navigation systems. He actually manages to riz her up until the plane's power goes off, I guess already signaling the aliens are here despite them showing up a little while later. Or maybe it's actually his phone causing that. That would be creepy if the aliens are already there, but just like waiting in the clouds or something. They land and we get to see Russian airport and the food. Yum. Sean's wearing a slightly torn suit, setting up his characters being rather lazy, with his art obviously being taking a stand and fighting for something. They drive through Moscow while Mokba by Marcelle plays, a song about the pain of heartbreak and loss, which could foreshadow how these two will suffer a loss from their business partner, or maybe because it's a cool song. They discuss their app and how it connects people to the hottest bars and places, connecting with all sorts of travelers. However, when they meet their business partner Skyler, it turns out he's stolen their idea because they didn't sign an NDA, which, in hindsight, was probably a huge oversight. Also would have liked to see this app actually play a role, maybe if Skylar had accepted their offer but later reveals how he's going to betray them so you could actually see the app work and maybe a cool scene of a business meeting getting interrupted by some aliens wrecking havoc on a skyscraper. Or maybe later on they use the app to connect to other people and find out where they are after establishing some cellular service or something. Or maybe some backstory on how they met Skylar and him being nice so this seems like a betrayal. I don't know, something more plot heavy instead of this. I know the director said they would not have Russians be the typical bad guys like in most movies, and Skylar isn't Russian, but I love how the first and only person they meet in the high position of power in Russia immediately screws him over and is a jackass. Cute? Yeah. I mean, if he's the one on the left. Love the Blackberry, so early 2010s. Also, if she means Ben who is on the left, why does she never show any interest in him and ends up with Sean? I know people can change who they have a crush on, obviously, but throughout the film she's only interested in Sean, so it makes it seem like they met Sean on the right. Matt, his friend is wearing a Snuggie with a bolo tie. I know you're into that, don't lie. So wait, they are talking about Ben, because Sean's the friend with the bolo tie. Huh, weird. I thought I forgot a part in the movie, but no, after rewatching it again for like a second or third time, no, they show no interest in each other. Sean and Ben leave to go to the Zvezda Club, which only seems to be a place in Bulgaria, where they talk about what other plans to do. Sean is, as Ben puts it, delusionally optimistic and not sweating it, a legitimately interesting character trait of a slacker who seems to always have some insane idea up his sleeve. Wish they did more of it beforehand as the evasion is coming very soon, it can make for some funny or serious moments for guys to get attached to him and make him more than two-dimensional. They see Skylar with this date, who just so happens to be at the bar, and of course walks to them, feeding his own ego and cementing himself as a self-righteous prick. They find Natalie and Anne and have some drinks, having a uh, generic fun, until they go outside and see the aliens coming down. At first they think they're northern lights, which is actually a cool effect, 
almost seems like an intentional mislead by the aliens which is kinda sinister, until it's revealed they want to disintegrate people for energy. They start wrecking havoc in the bar, electrocuting people and disintegrating some more people, and killing Skylar State after he locks her out. We get some more legitimately fun action until the five of them, Sean, Ben, Natalie, Anne, and Skylar, along with some bartender, hide in a storage room, wherein said bartender dies. I kinda wish they didn't go in the storage room, I really love the initial hours slash days of the apocalypse, so seeing them time skip really makes you realize they didn't have the budget for it. They leave to go to the US Embassy while they go through a completely ash-ridden city. Everyone gone, but hey, at least the McDonald's chicken wrap is still here. They go through town and find a lady boarding up with cement. Oh, so she was just pointing to where you're all gonna die? Yeah, dude, she obviously said something more than that. They come across a bridge and... Okay, so they had just enough budget to show some cool aftermath effect shots? Alright. They find a cop car and some supplies, but hide under it once an alien comes, just nearly missing them as the five run into a mall as Skylar freaks out after seeing some ash move, with Ben getting angry. Although he's in the right to be scared, I mean you literally can't see them except for the slight yellowish tint they have and the effects it has on other things, like moving the ash for example. He's an ass, but in this situation he's making sense. They find a crash plan, indicating that maybe finding the embassy won't do much good. Skylar freaks out, basically reiterating the point I just made. However, Sean points out that electricity gives the aliens away, and that going out at night works out much better than day. Kind of a reversal of the horror movie trope of the nighttime being dangerous. They find some light bulbs as it turns to night, and honestly, I'm impressed they managed to make Moscow look so desolate. I know technology can edit people out, but for a mid-budget 2011 film, it's pretty good and instills a feeling of dread. Dude, gonna get it right this time? Okay, Skylar's starting to become my favorite character. He's the only one with a halfway decent arc and character change. He's clearly just trying to make banter and develop his character, but everyone's dead set on him being an asshole, which he is, but not nearly as much as before. Gee golly, I really do hope he lives to the end and has a good character arc, as he's the only compelling character in the film. Hell, he even has a good discussion validating Sean's earlier thoughts about him being just a thief and not a wolf. He's really just a scared businessman trying to make money, but now he's starting to change, or at the very least take charge and accountability for what he's done. Wow, an actually interesting scene, and it's not one where it's just action happening. Nice. Sean and Natalie go out looking for clothes, with Sean looking at her undressing. Is it forgetting the last time he did that, there was a movie about it. Learn from your mistakes, Sean. Eventually, one of the aliens comes in, and the two hide behind a glass wall, theorizing that they can only see humans' electrical charge, even though we know that's not true because cars, while being electrical, their metals not, yet the aliens saw through the trunk to see some weapons. But I guess they mean they can't fully see through glass and other non-electrical insulators, and also because metal is a conductor of electricity. Also, Natalie very clearly likes Sean, so why was there that whole thing about her having a crush on Ben? Kinda pointless and could've used it for important info that wouldn't be contradicted later on. They run through the streets and find the US Embassy completely desolated, which makes sense. That would be like one of the first things to go in an apocalypse like this. Skylar picks up an assault rifle as the other search the Embassy, finding logbooks that confirm this is in fact Mr. Worldwide, uh, I mean just Worldwide. They see Skylar shooting and find him as he holds off some aliens, getting doubly disintegrated for his efforts. Great, now the most interesting character is dead, and I mean dead. Like, you, you don't come back from that. They find an apartment with a light on, and find a girl named Vika and a man named Sergi, who has a cat. Aww, cute! Sergi's made his room into a Faraday cage, which is used to block electromagnetic fields. This is the big exposition scene, meaning we're heading into our third act. They figure out a Russian nuclear submarine is in the north end of the Moscow River, and is leaving at 6am the next day. Vika, Natalie, and Anne leave to go to find supplies, while Sergi, Sean, and Ben talk. Sergei shows him his microwave gun, which shoots out a high-density compressed microwave beam to break apart the aliens' energy fields, leaving them defenseless against guns and other weapons. He also surmises if they are wave energy fields and they can connect the charges, they can take out multiple in a row. Back with Vika, Natalie, and Anne, Anne splits up as they run away from the aliens. They get inside the cage as the aliens come in as well, and Sergei shoots the microwave gun once, and it works! Until the other alien comes in and disintegrates him. Look, this is just a small complaint, not even really a complaint, just a thing I noticed, but in that clip, Sergei is still screaming when his upper half has been disintegrated. Either it was a small audio error, or they were implying he's still technically alive. Probably just a small error, but imagine if they were still alive, just absorbed. Come to think of it, they never really explain how they disintegrate them. They just do? And how is their ash left? Seriously, did this movie predict Infinity War? They all escape, except for Anne, who too dies. Yeah, bet you forgot about her. Pretty boring character. 
The apartment is lit on fire as the four remaining survivors escape, with Natalie horrified at what she just saw. Don't worry, the Russians are here, and actually save them and hurt one of the aliens, taking a piece off of it for good measure. They introduce themselves to the group and bring them down to where some others are and tell them about their plan to go to the Moscow River for their nuclear submarine. They are initially reluctant, but eventually decide to help them and go through the metro as Sean and Natalie continue bonding. They hear some noise and throw down some light bulbs, which would totally work. They totally wouldn't just break because they're light bulbs and extremely fragile. Sure. They get onto the tracks, but Vika is stuck behind a pillar the aliens coming closer to. Ben decides to put away his microwave gun and saves her, with him of course getting killed. Seriously, what an avoidable death. Just bring the microwave gun and have the other guy shoot at it as well, or just shoot at it to distract it from killing Ben. Literally anything other than watching him die. They get out with the soundtrack doing wonders to improve the scene. Seriously, Tyler Bates is awesome in literally everything he does. They eventually find a boat and get on it, but a collapsing building tips it over, with Natalie disappearing. Thus, Sean and some others go off to find her while the rest are on the submarine, waiting to leave. They go off into an abandoned factory-esque place with trains, fighting some aliens in another cool action scene, and I gotta say, I like this movie a lot more when the Russians come in. They're just here to do business, and by business I mean destroying the hell out of the aliens as efficiently as possible. The other characters are fine, would have liked to see Skylar interact with the later characters, but the Russians are just so much cooler. It helps that they're not so bland and are helpful to the main characters. However, it's here where the aliens' actual design is revealed, and oh my gosh, they look like actual shit with buck teeth and eyes. <laughs> kind of a disappointing final reveal, expected something more, but hey, at least we get one more cool action scene on the way. Sean finds Natalie in the bus, and then as an alien gets in, it powers the bus enough to get moving. They evade it for some time before eventually killing it by a wave of exploding, and get back on the submarine as the film ends with them hearing about other survivors fighting back. And that was The Darkest Hour. Not bad, but not good. Its plot does get stupider and more boring if you think of it. There's a lot of wasted potential, especially since they just skip past the initial day of the apocalypse and go into the world is basically gone mode, but it's a lot of fun in other places. The first half has some cool moments, and Skylar is a genuinely compelling character, and when he dies, it's like the film knows he was the most interesting, and thus we get decent replacements, especially with the Russians. It has some decent kills and has enough of a plot to keep it moving and not make it out say it's welcome, especially if this is just a one-time watch. Overall, it's decent for a short movie night when you can't find anything and just want something unique and bizarre to watch. I'd still recommend Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter more, but there's something worthwhile in this film too. It remains a fun, if not very good relic of 2011. If you enjoyed this video, you can like and subscribe, as it helps out majorly with the channel, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye